Hello there. In this video, I'd like to present a short talk that I gave at the SLE 2014 conference as part of the roundtable Quo Vadis Linguistics in the 21st Century. So the title that I've chosen for this talk is The Big To-Do List, Identifying Challenges for 21st Century Linguistics. Now, um, why did I do this video? After the conference, I was asked to prepare a text version for the diversity linguistics comment blog and I asked whether I could just put my talk on video and was granted permission to do so. So here we are. What do I want to do in this talk? Well first of all I'd like to show you a picture of this gentleman here, David Hilbert. You probably know him. He's a famous mathematician and one of the reasons for him being so famous is that he formulated a set of challenges for his discipline, mathematics. And these challenges are called the Hilbert problems. And they prompted some vigorous research efforts and ultimately they also led to breakthrough successes. Yeah? So some of the original Hilbert problems were solved. Others have been shown to be just badly formulated so they don't actually have any solution and others are still awaiting their solution. So all in all, formulating these challenges has been a great idea that has proven very productive. Now, what I would like to discuss in this video is whether it is possible and maybe also desirable to identify challenges for linguistics in the 21st century and to get rid of the inevitable pun right away, uh, I'm not going to present you with a list of Hilpert problems, which would be a little preposterous. Okay. So, rather, I'll ask a number of questions that might lead us towards points for discussion, and I'll also point to a number of scientific challenges that have been um, defined elsewhere in other academic disciplines and that require the collaboration of linguists. Now, let me ask you a little question. <clears throat> Imagine that you are at a party, you talk to the other guests, people hear that you're a linguist, and of course they're interested in that, and uh, somebody asks you, okay, in your opinion, what have been the most important linguistic discoveries? Now, chances are that a light sweat will form on your forehead, you know, you're a little uncomfortable, but after you've had the chance to think about this for two or three minutes, you come up with a number of ideas. For instance, you could say, well, William Jones discovered Proto-Indo-European and that gave us a whole new idea of how languages are related, how languages evolve. Mm, you could talk about linguistic typology and mention Joseph Greenberg and um, implicational universals, so you could explain to your interlocutor what implicational hierarchies are. You could point to developments in sociolinguistics and uh, explain how Bill Lebov analyzed socially stratified uh, variation in language. You could mention Lakoff and Johnson's conceptual metaphors and how human thought is very much embodied and metaphorically grounded. Or you could uh, point to Berlin and K and the scale of basic color terms. So all of these are really interesting and fascinating linguistic discoveries that at least I find central and very important. Your list will look a little different, but these are five things that I uh, came up with. Now, um, your interlocutor listens, you know, nods in all the right places, and you think you're doing a pretty good job, but then suddenly she comes back and asks a new question, namely, okay, so these phenomena that you told me about, they're all fairly, you know, old. Now, what are the most important problems that linguists are currently investigating? Where is the cutting edge of the field right now? Okay. You feel a sudden flash of heat on your face, knowing that, okay, this will be a little difficult to get out of. Um, well, and you're busy thinking, you know, what is the cutting edge of linguistics right now? Um, yeah, in your opinion, what are the most important problems right now? Under the pressure of the situation, I would probably talk about points such as the following. 
Yeah. Um, so one thing that linguists are doing right now is we try to document the many languages that will become extinct very soon. So languages uh, are disappearing at an alarming rate. We need to send people to the field to document them. Or uh, I could point to advances in neurolinguistics and say, well, we try to work out how the brain processes language. Or now, if you're talking to somebody who's more engineering minded, you might say, well, we try to teach computers to understand meaning. Yeah, linguists are, are, are needed to, to do that together with computer scientists. Or um, in a similar vein, we try to understand language variation better through big data and statistical methods. Again, your list of topics will look different from mine, but well, here are four things that I would come up with in that situation. Again, our interlocutor nods in agreement and uh, no, um, gives you some credit for that, but she is merciless. So the next question is already coming up. And uh, that question is, okay, if you could assemble a team of the most skilled colleagues you have, and you had three years to do anything you like, all expenses paid, what would be your project? Okay. Just imagine, you know, five of your favorite linguists, you'd be given the chance to call them up and say, hey, work with me on this project. Everything's paid for. Well, I'm ashamed to admit that if I were asked that question, I would not have an immediate response. You know, if some of you do, great. But I think most people actually would need a few days to think about this. Huh? What problem is the most pressing? Who would you need on board to help you solve the problem? Those are not exactly trivial questions. And if you are like me, you're simply not used to thinking about grand scientific challenges. So my challenges are a lot smaller. I think about things like, how do I get my paper published? How do I get this grant proposal accepted? How do I get through another faculty meeting? Those kinds of things. So I'm busy addressing my small challenges, and perhaps that's a problem. Perhaps we should set some time aside to think about grand challenges, about big problems, and draw up a big to-do list for the 21st century. So identifying issues that we might work on together and that can only be solved if we work on them together. Now, importantly, this is work that doesn't get done by itself. Uh, identifying the challenges is part of the work and these things need time. You don't just wake up one morning knowing what the field needs. So the field of linguistics would have to arrive at some kind of consensus of criteria against which we can measure the importance of a linguistic problem. Okay, In fields such as medicine or engineering or economics, that is actually simpler, yeah? more straightforward. Um, so in these fields, the most fundamental criterion is whether the removal of a problem has a positive impact on the lives of as many human beings as possible. Okay, Does this make human lives better? And it's slightly ironic that disciplines that identify themselves as humanities apparently are not that closely connected to the well-being of human beings. Yeah. Uh, can we as linguists really hope to improve people's lives? And if so, how can we do that? Okay, I realize that this is actually a tricky issue. You know, can we even justify to prioritize real-world applications that address the well-being of humans um, over basic research? And you'll remember that the five points, you know, the, the, my five favorite uh, linguistic discoveries they're not actually applied. They don't make human lives better in any immediate sense. So it's great to know about the scale of basic color terms. Uh, it's great to know about conceptual metaphors, but in the end, that rests, uh, you know, that, that, that is very academic knowledge. Okay, so my time is almost up. So I would like to close with a few examples of grand challenges that have been formulated by uh, a sociologist from Zurich, uh, Dirk Helbing. So these problems may be called Helbing problems. And uh, well, here are seven. He has a web page. I encourage you to go to his web page and check out 
his problems. Um, these seven make the top of his list, and I want to read them to you. First, how to reach a balance of power in the multipolar world. Second, how to promote security and peace. Third, what are the contributing factors and dynamics of conflict. Fourth, what contributes to the spreading of crime and corruption. Five, how can poverty and precarious living conditions be reduced? Six, how to increase the quality of life, satisfaction, and well-being of people. And seven, how to promote public health. Now, I think you can agree that these are very important questions, very important problems that directly address the well-being of human beings. At the same time, it is not exactly clear how linguistics could play a role in the solution of these problems. However, Helbing's list is very long and there are a lot of problems in which linguistics actually can contribute. So here are five of those. I'd also like to read those of you. Uh, first, how to bridge between qualitative and quantitative social science approaches. Well, linguistics is perhaps unique in its position between the humanities and the natural sciences. So when it comes to bridging qualitative and quantitative research, we have quite a bit of experience, so we can be a major player in this game. Second, are there explanatory principles underpinning human societies, and if yes, which ones? Well, sociolinguists have long been concerned with the factors that explain socially stratified phenomena, so I think that we could offer quite a bit of help in this case here, too. Third, how to model cognitive complexity, subjectivity, emotions, and learning. Well, cognitive complexity is a notion, well, a difficult notion, of course, but a notion that informs several linguistic theories of very different stripes. So again, I think we are on our home turf here, actually, and we can productively uh, contribute to this discussion. Fourth, what are the factors determining the speed and range of the spreading of different opinions, beliefs, ideologies, and new ideas? How does consensus emerge, and to what extent can it be predicted? Okay, historical linguists have dealt with the spread of linguistic structures and features, so we actually have a lot of data about how these processes work. We know a great deal about this complex of questions. Five. How does innovation arise? What drives or impedes innovation? Again, innovation is ubiquitous in language variation and change, so we know quite a few things about this as well. In sum, you know, looking at these problems, um, it is perhaps normal that linguists think of themselves as not having a whole lot to offer when it comes to solving grand scientific challenges. But I think, and I hope to convince you, that this is a misconception. So the next time you have the chance to do so, talk to an economist or a geographer or a sociologist, and it may turn out that much of what you know and what you can do is actually quite relevant and quite useful and can play a role in solving one of these grand problems. Okay. Um, I would like to leave you with this question that you've already seen, yeah, um, if you could assemble a team of your favorite linguists or your favorite scientists, for that matter, um, and you had three years to do anything you like, what would be your project? Yeah, think about that for a couple of minutes, maybe after work today, and um, you know, if we do that on a regular basis, there might be good things coming out of that. All right, with that, I'd like to leave you and thank you for your attention.